Hello, and welcome to another episode of Radio Dell. I'm your host, Chris O'Dell, and when this is where I bring you good tidings from interesting folks that I know. Today, our guest is Jordan Goldstein. He is a uh, hum- sports humanities professor uh, with also a pretty heavy background in history, so he does a really interesting job of um, researching and conveying a lot of uh, different things with the connection between sports history politics uh, mythology even so uh we had a really we had a fun conversation i really enjoyed this one a lot i think uh, i think just about everybody will find something interesting in this one uh we also could have gotten into just straight politics and a lot of other things because if you uh if you take a look at him on twitter for instance which is where i ran into him we kind of have some mutual acquaintances uh, he's up in canada um you know he posts about a lot of interesting things and i think he has some really wise takes on a on, on a wide range of subjects but we kept it mostly in the sports realm uh like i said hist- historically mythological connections and other things um it's uh so it was I, I had a lot of fun with this one i really did it was a uh, it was a good time and i hope you guys appreciate it so uh without further ado from me here we go Here we are coming to you uh, live from, I'm still in my, my guest bedroom in the house, haven't gotten a proper studio set up, but we welcome, uh, welcoming you, uh, Jordan uh, Goldstein. Is it Stein or Steen? It's Steen. Steen. Okay, good. Got <laughs> and uh, excellent. And uh, so you are one of the people who I've been chatting with on, on Twitter here and there. We have some mutual friends and, and, uh, and yeah, I thought it would be fun to have a talk with you. And it's you have an interesting uh, profession, a sports humanities teacher at uh, up at Wilfrid L- Lawyer, which is up in uh, Canada, and we'll probably get into that. That's a whole special topic of stuff going on there, uh, political things lately. But oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's an that's an interesting uh, interesting interesting subject there, or a thing I didn't even know there was such a thing. So how did you uh, how did you get into that, and, and can you describe kind of what that's all about? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, thanks for for having me. First of all, um, sure. so I'm a I'm a trained historian. Um, I did my undergrad and my master's uh, in history, but I always had a very strong interest in sport and its convergence, especially with uh, politics and uh, nationalism and national identity. So as I was thinking about going into a PhD, um, this was the kind of topic that I wanted to talk about, mm-hmm. which led me away from history departments and into kinesiology departments, which actually house specialized uh, sport historians. And the thing that I was really interested in was the conflation between uh, ice hockey and Canadian identity and uh, sort of in- investigating yeah. where, where, this, uh, where this came about. And so in my PhD, I, pardon me, I investigated that connection through the donation of the Stanley Cup, which is the uh, the trophy that's still handed out at the end of the uh, the Stanley Cup playoffs mm-hmm. uh, for for the NHL. And this sort of led me into what's broadly known uh, within the field as the sociocultural study of sport. Um, but I prefer sport humanities as a mm-hmm. as a uh, as a description. So that's what I go with. Sure. Um, and I guess I can't speak broadly but i can i can speak to what we do in in my department which i think is a good um introduction to what kinesiology can be so in our program we are science-based and we are humanities-based so the the students generally come in uh, with a science inclined uh, motivation but we want to give them a holistic experience so we don't want to just teach them how the body works um, and how to go out and organize um, sporting organizations or teams uh, within the community, which is great. But we want to provide that cultural and historical context as to what sport means and what's its value uh, in our society. Um, mm. So that has allowed me to broaden my um, my interests past just sport history. Um, I teach sport philosophy courses uh, and also sport sociology alongside of of history. So this is really, I would say, opened me up to mm-hmm. more broad based and interesting studies and also merging uh, the physical sciences with the humanities in terms of uh, research programs, 
uh, and also just the way that I view sport in general now. Um, so it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of broad, but it's basically just the, any of those social or cultural or philosophic or historical ways in which we can investigate sport is what I would call sport humanities, uh, broadly. Mm -hmm. That's cool. I could see that getting kind of interesting. I know, especially if you, if you go back, um, you know, get really historical with it. I mean, the earliest thing I remember as far as someone recounting historical sports, I believe it was, I think it was Campbell was talking about, was it a Mayan thing where it, I mean, it could have been Joe Rogan talking, I'm trying to remember now, but mm -hmm. a thing where like the losing team would have sent, or maybe it was the winning team would essentially sacrifice themselves at the end. Was that a Mayan thing or? Yeah, you know? it was a, it was a, a Mesoamerican ball game. I forget the exact name of it, um, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's got a long history going back, I think, to the Olmecs and through the Mayas and, and most famously displayed in the Aztec Empire. And yeah, there was a ball game that was played. It was one of the one of really the only team sports that was played before the modern the modern period. Most sports mm. were, gen were generally individual um, and it was a ritual. And that's sort of where a lot of sport actually comes from, sort of in a ritual, mythological, religious uh, context. Mm -hmm. And they don't really and this isn't necessarily my my area so it could be a little off on it but i believe they're not really sure which team was sacrificed uh. but there definitely were sacrifices related to to the outcome of the game and sometimes the games <laughs> would go for days and days um yeah. and certainly if the losing team was sacrificed you would want you would understand why that would be and same thing with the winning think, yeah <laughs> yeah i had a thought i had a thought the other day when i was running that maybe they just decided at the end yeah this, this this day would be the winning team this day would be the losing team so as to yeah. not but, but <laughs> affect the way you'd be playing to hopefully yeah. not get killed at the end <laughs> yeah yeah i have no and that was just it's just a thought that that popped into my head um seems logical <laughs> yeah it's and so there is a long the long hit a long long history um in d many different cultures when it comes to to sport and one of the classes that i teach uh, we call it womb to the tomb because it sort of starts out at the very beginning and we come all the way well, all the way to the end um and sometimes i focus on prehistory so um mm -hmm. like anthropological man and hominids and and sort of us as a physical species in terms of running uh, and walking and the way that that affected our um our evolution in terms of physiology, but also mm -hmm. uh, in terms of psychology. Mm -hmm. um, but when we get into histor the historical record, um, the earliest iterations we see of this is in ancient Greece, mm -hmm. um, all the way back to the ancient Olympics. Uh, right. Which were still pretty much what pri primarily solo sports, with the exception of maybe uh, pancreation or something like that, where you at least have one opponent. Yeah. Um, Right. Yeah, there would have been, it, they were all individual sports. Um, even even something like the chariot race, I guess, would have been maybe the uh, most competitive, most combatants, competitors. Mm -hmm. uh, but but they're all individual sports. There was no conception of, of team games, uh, mm -hmm. especially not in the Olympics. So mm -hmm. when we're talking about sport or uh, organized sport, we're talking about something that we would recognize today with our sport culture, uh, like a regulated schedule, uh, standardized rules, mm. records, uh, statistics, measurements, um, spheres, different spheres of competition, right? So in mm -hmm. ancient Greece, you would compete within your polis, your city state. And then if you were to be um, victorious there, you would move on to one of the minor festivals and there were many different athletic festivals that would go on and mm -hmm. then there was the major festival circuit so there was four major festivals that happened two of them happened every four years and another two of them happened every two years with the the olympic games being the pinnacle mm -hmm. but also the um the pythian games uh um oh my goodness and the other two are, are escaping me uh, right now, but there were the Nemean Games and the Isthmian Games. Sorry, uh, mm -hmm. and those were the those were the four major festivals. And so, just like with today, right? If you win, you know your cities. If you're a high school athlete, let's say you win your city's right. championship, you move on to the state or the regional, mm -hmm. finals, and then you go to the national, and then maybe you go international. So yeah. they had recognized spheres of of competition as well in terms of levels, uh, with the Olympics being uh, uh, the pinnacle. Uh, largely due to they're the oldest, but also a very strong religious tie um, to the uh, 
to the temple at Zeus uh, at, mm-hmm. at, at Olympia. And even the other yeah. festivals were all based in in some sort of religious ceremony dedicated to the different gods, the Pythian games to Apollo, the Isthmian games to uh, Poseidon, uh, and the mm-hmm. Nemean games also to Zeus, just like the uh, the Olympic games. That's interesting. So, so do, are the Greeks one of the first civilizations to really have sports as we as we know it? Then, I would say that they're the first, and that's mm-hmm. not to say that other cultures didn't have physical contests, because I think sure. all cultures across the world have these sort of physical contests, but mm-hmm. they weren't organized in such a regular standardized format as we see with the Greeks Uh, and the ancient Olympics they ran for about a thousand years uh, uninterrupted from 776 BCE to to 394 uh, in the common era so you've got a long history and that includes wars on the Greek uh, homeland uh, being taken over by foreign invaders multiple different foreign invaders Um, and it was only the Christian Roman Emperor Theodosius, I believe, and I, I could be wrong on on the name, um, but mm-hmm. whatever the the Roman Empire Emperor at that time was, uh, he banned them as pagan celebrations. So they were banned <laughs> on they were banned on religious grounds. Um, yeah. but that's but even 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 during the entire time of Roman occupation and domination, uh, the Olympic Games were still they were they were still uh, they kept they they kept going. Um, and so that would be, I think, the first. The first iteration of what we would recognize as as the sporting culture that we have today, uh, mm. especially with something like records, which I think is really is a really important facet of sport. Um, you have records going back all the way to those first games, and these were not trivial things to the Greeks. You know, if you were a champion, you got a statue at Olympia. You also got a statue, likely in your home polis. Uh, and and you became a standard bearer in terms of performance, right? And everybody who came after you would try to measure up and then exceed. So it gives us that sense uh, that athletics is very important in terms of achievement, but also in pushing achievement uh, to the next level. And this was something that the Greeks were very, very interested in, um, mm. attaining perfection, but then moving beyond, moving beyond what was thought of as perfection. And you see this with... Um, heroic athletes not just sort of transcending transcending um greece in terms of being praised as athletes but they actually could transcend um mortality like athletes would be uh prayed to they would be turned into hmm. demi they'd be prayed into demigods uh and were thought to through their athletic prowess and performance to have showcased to the other greeks that they had writ they had that they were you know, more than it's more than a more than a mortal. Mm-hmm. Certainly favored, if if nothing else, <laughs> by their oh, particular gods. Yeah, yeah. A- absolutely. And there's many many interesting um, stories from that that time period of these heroes, which is what um, what they were called, mm-hmm. uh, and that sort of goes back to the the mythological foundations uh, of the Olympic Games. There are many founding myths, but they all seem to center on this notion of of unity. Uh, and peace, which which I find re- really interesting in terms of what are these contests supposed to be symbolizing? They're closely tied to religion. One of the big founding myths of the Olympics is that they were founded by Heracles uh, or Hercules. Mm-hmm. So after he goes through the 12 physical labors, mm-hmm. he goes to Olympia and he founds the games. Uh, and he provides prizes, and he does this in order to bring peace to the Greek, uh, to the Greek uh, nations, essentially. So we get this sort of lineage of Olympics as these peaceful and unifying um, ceremonies and celebrations, uh, and that's one of the reasons why they were uh, why they were engaged in for for so long, and it also provided a lot of the philosophical inspiration pardon me uh mm-hmm. for the modern for the modern olympics um in terms of it being considered a peace movement um and more than just yeah. a sporting it's more than just a sporting event it's more than just a right. a world championships and they're sort of they're tr- they were trying to bring back that essence uh, of these of those ancient olympics yeah yeah 
Yeah, I like that. It's still kind of fun to this day. I still I still get a little excited about the Olympics. It's kind of neat. It's a mm-hmm. it's a cool thing. I, I do wish though they'd find a way to televise them without having so many commercials. It drives me absolutely <laughs> crazy. And I, cause I don't even have regular TV anymore. So the last time they were on, it was like trying to find a way to watch them with as a cord cutter was uh, <laughs> extremely difficult. <laughs> yeah, and especially since they were over in uh, in South Korea. Which yeah, I can imagine, I can imagine cause you're three hours. Uh, you're three hours west of me, and it was pretty. It was pretty tough on our schedule here in the east. Yeah, um, yeah. Trying to catch cool. anything live it wasn't really happening. Yeah, no. <laughs> that's cool. So that's interesting stuff. It, and the original Greek games, I'm curious. They probably didn't have. It was probably just within Greece, did, or did they are? Did they start inviting people from other countries at that point? They never invited people from other countries. It was exclusively for Greeks only. There were ethnic mm-hmm. qualifications. Mm-hmm. Um, and these were never lifted. The only exceptions would have been uh, high-ranking Roman officials during the time of Roman occupation. Um, some Roman emperors <laughs> did, um, enter into the chariot race, for example, um, where the winning, where the person who got the medal was the owner of the horses, not the person that, uh, not not the person that actually um, jockeyed the chariot. It's mm-hmm. probably not the, not the right term, but that's that's okay. Um, sure. And so. Yeah, I mean, if you are being told by the Roman emperor that they want to compete, you're going to you're going to bend the rules pretty, pretty quickly. But other than that, um, no, it was not something for people outside of the Greek world. It was a Greek thing for the Greeks by the Greeks. Mm, Interesting. So when um, jumping around a a little bit, when would you say politics ended up? kind of getting injected into sports a little bit because I, I i was having a discussion i remember when the whole thing was going on with the kneel don't kneel whatever and then the football set and my yeah. one of my friends reminded me said well actually there's been a lot of politics in sports for a long time because a lot of people would say well this isn't the time or place which you could still argue that but it seems like it's been something that's that's been occurring for much longer than this current incident when when do we start seeing that sort of thing happen is that tra- really an american thing or i mean obviously the olympics there was there was an issue back in Hitler's time. Um, oh, absolutely. But, yeah. um, well, let's, I'll bring it into the, the modern day because I would argue that sport and politics have been largely intertwined for their existence. I mean, mm-hmm. we, can, we, can go, we could go back to ancient Greece, but uh, my area focuses in the 19th century, where is where we see kind of like the rebirth or the reemergence of that kind of ancient sporting culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and right from the get-go, it's kind of a political activity in in the sense that we can tie the emergence of the first modern sport maybe um and this is probably up for debate but i would say is probably cricket and this was a sport that was devised by english aristocrats um, mm. during during the 18th century when they wrote down the rules codified it standardized the game and started uh, competing with other teams regularly and so this process emerged as the English were coming to grips with the, the um, aftermath of their civil war mm-hmm. uh, and sort of the glorious revolution. And so famous sociologists um, have talked about this convergence. Um, on one hand, we have what's known as par- parliamentization, which is the purging of violence out of politics, right? So we slowly replace... Um, political changes through through violence or force or, and uh, and war and conquest with debates in parliament between parliamentarians. So we're slowly purging violence from uh, the decision making and politics. And that's also the same thing that occurs uh, with sports at that same time. Mm. Up until the, that time, sports were very irregular, erratic, extremely violent, um, <laughs> whether they were um, done by the elite or by um, sort of the peasant class. And Mm -hmm. so we start to see with the emergence of cricket, this purging of violence and a greater organization within sport. So really, Mm. and this is a a lot of what my my dissertation focused on, that there's a twin process of of the political process of removing violence and substituting nonviolent means with the same processes in the pastimes and leisure practices of peoples, especially when it came to these physical contests, which um, hmm. were extremely violent and extremely dangerous uh, up until they started purging that as well. So I would argue that they're always sort of entwined, that these 
political processes uh, have always led to the developments in sport or vice versa, and I'm not sure which came first. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's tough to know. But in terms of direct political implications, even with something like um, the amateur code, for example, right? So this was a code that was imprinted upon sport by generally speaking the middle classes in the 19th century and this basically said there's only one correct way to engage in these types of sports that is for honor only right we don't take external rewards we don't take money we don't compete for fame uh, we're honorable in defeat we're gracious when we win those sorts of um mm -hmm. moral those sorts of moral qualities that we as associate with sport but these were also used to exclude large populations of people from participating it was like a class-based doctrine so written mm -hmm. into the eligibility requirements of of being able to compete in these sporting competitions couldn't be a laborer couldn't be a working classman uh, couldn't have taken any money um, there were in certain uh, parts of the world there were some racial elements to this like in canada where where I am uh, and where I'm from, this was used to exclude First Nations or Indigenous peoples. It was written mm -hmm. right right into the eligibility requirements. So even yeah. um, even this notion of sport and politics as being separate, uh, I think is largely. I don't know if that's ever existed. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to things like political protests or political stands or inserting domestic political grievances into sport that's something yeah. that's not as common and i think that's what right. most people think of when they think of sport and politics certainly mm -hmm. like the, the kaepernick protest that you're talking about or right. the uh, or the one or the protest that inspired it the uh, the black power salute at the 1968 mexico olympics mm -hmm. uh, as as well or like you mentioned as well with the 1936 games in pardon me in, in berlin mm -hmm. which were overtly overtly politicized and it sort of it, it opened up, I think, people's eyes to some of the contradictions within the Olympic movement, because the Olympics, on one hand, claim to be non-political. We're sporting. We don't want to involve domestic political issues within the, the hosting of these uh, yeah. games. But on the other hand, they have these overt political goals like universal peace and brotherhood and international harmony. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, well, how do you bring those two together? In 1936, we saw that contradiction colliding mm -hmm. uh, so i would say sport and politics have have always been in uh always been intertwined together uh and it manifests differently in different situations and different contexts um that would, that would i guess be my answer mm -hmm. interesting okay and you mentioned the uh like the difference between pro and, and amateur and all that stuff and i i'm wondering when when was it that we start seeing you know the real evolution of the professional athlete come along where people are getting paid you know, even a small amount, but obviously now these days, quite large amounts. Yeah. When did that develop? It was always a tension um, because, again, there was this contradiction because sports, modern sports emerged largely through the middle classes, like with the Industrial Revolution and the creation of a large middle, a large middle class. And especially a large middle class in a brand new urban industrial environment, right? You have scores, mm -hmm. scores of hundreds of thousands of people moving into the cities. And sport became kind of like a tool um, in order to give people an activity that was moral, that would create a community in these what these uh, people believed to be artificial cities, essentially. They were unnatural places to live uh, at this time period. And so the middle class largely steered sport. And there's this always this funny class tension that goes on with the middle class. On one hand, they always aspire towards the elites. So they had seen aristocrats playing sports. So they, they, they decided this, was, this is one of our tickets into respectable and polite society. Mm. Um, and on the other hand, if you want to be elevating your class status, you need to separate yourself from the lower class. So as they're pulling up to the top, they're stamping down on the bottom classes. So the amateur code was a way for them to differentiate and to separate themselves in competition uh, from the working classes. So if you're a working class, you never uh, you never really cared about professional or amateur because the only way you could involve yourself in sport was to be a professional, to take money because you didn't earn enough. You didn't have enough disposable income or time to, to take 
to take off your factory shifts or, or your mining shifts or, or whatever mm. whatever occupation you had. Mm -hmm. And so the amateur code was a way to restrict competition away from these middle class um, competitors. And so the, there was always a tension between pros and and amateurs mm -hmm. in in a place like the United States. This was probably relaxed because of the egalitarianism and the democratic ethos of the American uh, polity. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't really have a big issue with professionals versus amateur amateurs like they would say in Great Britain that has a very rigid class structure and a, uh -huh. and a rigid hierarchy. Um, so it also depends. Like we see professionalism emerge in America pretty pretty soon. Like you get the first professional baseball team in 1869, where all the players mm -hmm. are play, are played are paid. Pardon me, mm -hmm. uh, and that's the Cincinnati uh, Red Stockings. In mm -hmm. in Canada, it was a little bit later, but you can sort of see the professional game in America in the late 19th century, and there wasn't a long time between the imposition of sort of amateur ideals and the move to professionalism. And there was that class tension that was always at the middle uh, of this distinction between the two. And as you mentioned, it didn't start off in terms of big money. Uh, although mm. some some of the earlier players, they, they could make a pretty decent, they could make a pretty decent living for a couple months work. Um, but I would say the the professional game takes over the amateur game coming into the 20th century with the rise of mass mass culture, mm, right? Sure. Ma mass technology in terms of transportation, communications, facilitates travel, facilitates reporting, information being able to be shared across large distances in mm. very short amount of time. And this is what allows people to follow teams. It allows people to be invested in, in their local teams. Uh, and this is what really brings money and eyeballs to sports. And once you you insert that equation or into the equation, it's not long until that dominates and the amateur game is taken over. And another thing, the amateur game was not free of these issues that they they they, they talked about for professionals. They said professionals are essentially like prostitutes. Um, they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna take money. They're gonna throw games. They're not going to be honorable. They're gonna jump teams they're not going to be loyal but the amateur teams engaged in a lot of these practices they played play paid players under the table they cared about winning far more often than they did about the good nature of the game and they they're even uh, there was a term that that arose called shamaturism right amateur in name <laughs> amateur amateur in name only so mm -hmm. this idea that there was a pure version of sport is also uh um uh, pretty un untrue so it was this idea of do what we say, not what we do. But mm -hmm. then once there's enough people, there's a critical mass of people who are interested in this, uh, the money just starts to flow in. And by the 1920s, we get the what's called the golden era of professional sport um, mm -hmm. with baseball, especially in America, baseball stars, uh, boxing stars, horse racing um, and uh, college football mm -hmm. all taking all, all, all becoming massive. Uh, in this time and it's uh, and it's linked to that larger consumer culture uh, and the yeah. roaring 20s uh, and, and all of that and sport sort of took off uh, from there. Hmm. How do, in relation to that, how do you see things evolving? Because obviously, let's say like in the NFL, we've gotten to a point where people get paid just ungodly sums of money for 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 playing, and yep. you know people have different objections to it. I mean, you can look at it like, hey, whatever, it's a capitalistic system, and they get what they get. Um, but I know a lot of people get kind of bothered by the by the amount, and it does seem to affect you know, playing for eh, not just honor, I guess, but, but just, just playing because you love the sport and you want to be a good representative and all that and, and make a decent living. And it's turned into like, Oh, whoever can pay the most, you know, for me, but wh where do you see that going? Cause I, I wonder sometimes if that's part of what maybe turns people off to sports a lot these days. And I mean, how's it, how's it looking from your standpoint, as far as people's engagement and how they're feeling about all that? I think, it's interesting and it's funny that you you bring that up because today there's there, uh, it's going to be wide i think the announcement is going to come today that the biggest sports contract in history is going to be signed uh mike trout is a baseball player for the los angeles uh, angels um he's going to sign a contract it's reported to be 12 years 430 million dollars so 30, 30, 30 35 million dollars a year for mike trout uh, holy crap o over over the next dozen years wow and so that's kind of interesting uh personally 
uh, it doesn't matter to me. Private businesses uh, can pay whatever they want to their employers. And if uh, they've sure. got the revenues to sustain it, uh, mm -hmm. well, well, then that's fine. If you look at the amount of revenue that's generated in these sports, I think it's only fair that the players get to share in the increased profits that you see across the sporting uh, environment. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't want a situation where the where the owners are making way, way, way more and the players are, are kind of getting mm. the scraps off the table. Although right. some will even argue that they're still just getting the scraps when you look at the amount that's that's generated. Mm. In terms of public in terms of public perception, I do think the amounts of money alienate fans from athletes. And I think that was one of the big, uh, one of the alluring factors, especially of the sporting heroes of the past, is that they weren't so far removed from people. Mm -hmm. um, sporting stars, you know, even up until the 19, well, the 60s, 70s, and even 80s often worked two jobs. Like they wouldn't make, they would make enough. But they would supplement. They would be. They would work in their communities. They would be uh, seen. They'd be seen as civic leaders. Mm. Um, maybe not necessarily in their professional towns, although although that that certainly was frequent. But certainly in their hometowns, and it was because there wasn't as great of a separation. And I think the amounts of money are are moving the athlete away from the fan in terms of relatability. Um, yeah. Now, I think things like social media have kind of brought back a little bit of that instant mm. rapport. Like, like on Twitter, for example, you can add an athlete and you can you can interact with them, which wasn't possible, you know, ten years ago. So there may be some ways in which technology may be bridging that gap. But I I do think the big salaries. I'm not sure they're going to hurt the overall numbers of people watching, but I do think there's a connection that was there in the past that's not there when it comes to uh, athlete and, and fan. Um, yeah, so it's hard. It's hard to know where it, that's going to be. Sure, and also, it, I mean, I don't, I don't watch many team sports these days, but I know it, it, it's a weird thing because I don't really have a problem with how much money they're necessarily getting paid. But what what would bother me is if I was going to try to be attached to say. I don't know, maybe I live in Boston or I like Boston. I like, I want to be part of the Boston Red Sox. I like the way they, they conduct themselves or whatever, you know, to be into whatever they're creating, but then to watch players that go, well, I'll play with you if you pay me enough. And that's the only real reason. There's no, it kind of ruins the whole idea of, of a reason for rooting for a team other than the fact that I guess it's just pure locality at that point. Yeah, uh, it, 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 it seems to reduce fandom to more of a tribalistic kind of us versus them mentality as opposed to pride in your in your community yeah um but i don't think that that's necessarily precluded either i think there's lots of ability for people to have genuine and meaningful connections with pro teams and with pro players as well i do mm -hmm. think it's more diff i do think it's more difficult uh, yeah. for for sure but i don't think it's 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 precluded uh, mm -hmm. Per, per se. And this goes back, I mean, you can, these are the, the same arguments, right, that those amateurs were making in the 19th century about, well, mm -hmm. if we allow, if we allow external rewards to replace intrinsic motivations, then the game is, the game will be debased, right? The right. moral, the moral nature of the game uh, will be debased. And, you know, when I like to think about athletics, um, I like to think about them as this moral, blueprint i like to think of them as as norm as, as having a, an important normative function uh, in society and i think they always have but the thing that ties together maybe the ancient greek sporting culture that we were talking about and the reemergence would be the athlete is held up in society as a moral model like this is the this is a a, a way of acting that should be emulated mm -hmm. because it's it's virtuous yeah and i think there's a lot uh, I think there's a lot of good in, in that sort of an idea. But once you are in that position of, of sport being normative and moral, well, the things that don't conform to that vision then become immoral, right? Mm -hmm. So professionalism, again, was likened with prostitution. The players are just going to be, they're going to be mercenaries, right? They're mm -hmm. going to be like hired, hired goons uh, and hired guns and, and, Certainly in the sport that I study the most, which is ice hockey, the early professionals, uh, this is exactly how they how they behaved. They would they would sign a contract with one team in the middle of the season. They would jump from that team to another team, sign a different contract. 
Um, and it was it was these types of practices that allowed the amateurs to say, well, look at what happens when you allow external rewards to, to overtake intrinsic motivations. Now, they all they still had external rewards that drove them, but it wasn't quite as uh, explicit and out in the open. And so that tension between the professional game debasing the the moral quality of the sport has been something that's been around since, especially since uh, the modern in, in iteration of sport. But even going back to the ancient Greeks, this was something that they talked about. You know, the athlete was not supposed to be a professional. The athlete wasn't supposed to train day in, day out, uh, mm. and only dedicate themselves. And this eventually did happen. Um, this eventually did happen after the golden age, uh, the mm. golden era of of, uh, of Greek sports uh, in the fifth century that corresponds to sort of the golden era of the classical age. Um, but the, even those ancient Greek athletes, they were seen to, to substitute external for internal rewards. And they believed that this, again, morally debased the athlete. This is what took them from being someone to emulate to being someone who should be scorned and shunned. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it's interesting how that's changed. It's also interesting to me that uh, I was thinking about the definition of, you know, amateur. And I, I didn't even realize until watching the movie about, um, I think it's Bobby Moore, the, the golfer. Yep. You know, and he was an amateur, I think, his whole life. But I didn't realize that it didn't just mean, oh, you aren't as good. Because to me, it was always, oh, a pro means you're really, really good. An amateur just means you're not so great. And maybe, you you know, you dabble or something. I had no idea that it, that it had a completely different different connotation i guess uh, in the past mm -hmm. yeah. and um the, another thing that they that um perfect that would demarcate professional from amateur would be the notion of specialization which would lead to that as that assessment of professional more skilled more talented because this is the person that that's what they spend their time doing they train yeah. they, they train for hours and hours a day mm -hmm. um, and this was seen this some people think that this is um you know, this is what drives performance ahead is the specialization. And it mimics it mimics sort of a, a laissez faire uh, argument when it comes to economic production in terms of decentralization. And it's great that people can specialize. Right. Because then you can provide somebody else who's doing something, a different activity with the, the product of your specialty. They can provide you with their specialty and the corpus of knowledge in the economy on how to produce things becomes greater overall. Um, so, so there's a lot of interesting convergences when we can talk about sort of athletic skill and its mirroring uh, of even economic processes. But um, yeah, that doesn't preclude the the sense that the amateur is going to be less less skilled or less proficient. It might be, it might be the idea now is is totally different because even amateur athletes, if you think. Well, what is the pinnacle of the amateur athlete, right? That's the Olympics. Um, mm -hmm. all, all yeah. these, all these amateur athletes are subsidized, right? They all sure. receive, they all receive funds. They all receive funding or endorsements. Mm -hmm. Usually they get, yeah. they get government, they usually they are getting government funding. So it's not as if they're not receiving yeah. external rewards. And even if they win a gold medal at the Olympics, you know, countries will reward medal winners uh, mm. with, with monetary prizes. Like I think in, in Canada, if you win a gold medal, it's something like fifteen or twenty or twenty-five thousand dollars you get. Ah, nice from from the government. So yeah, sure, a little something. <laughs> was there a was that one thing I thought about? Was there ever a time where where because of how an, an outcome of a sports game, certain political decisions would be made? Like was there? Because I could just see that. Oh, all right, well, let's say Athens wins this year, then they, you know, get the favor of more tax money or something like that. <laughs> I don't know. Was was has that occurred? Uh, I'm not. I mean, it's very possible. I haven't come across anything uh, specifically like that. I know sport sporting events have been catalysts for political upheavals. One of the big ones would be a uh, a riot that started in between uh, Serbian fans and Croatian fans, mm -hmm. which was the kickoff to the dissolution of Yugoslav of Yugoslavia. That was basically they mark that as the start of the civil war. This huge soccer riot that they had oh. uh, be between the two um, between the two different uh, ethnic groups. Um, in terms of of like to the victor goes the spoils. Um, I don't see that in terms of outcomes of particular games, but maybe outcomes in terms of processes like bidding for mega events to come to your city. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe that might be the way that political influence 
uh, now seems to to work its way, but mm-hmm. I can't I can't yeah. think of an outcome of a match that really um, yeah. that really determined it. And I I definitely could be there. I'm there may be something out there. I just I haven't come across it. The closest thing that I think of is that um, that Serbia Croatia. I think it was in 1990. Uh, mm. that, that, that soccer that soccer That's riot, interesting. which which pretty much kicked off. And the the Croatian fans outside of Either that stadium or their national stadium, they have a they have a, a monument that says like this was the start of Croatian independence. Oh wow. Yeah. Huh, that's interesting. What is speaking of riots in sports, what what do you think it is? I mean, and, and this may get in more near specialty with nationalism, all that. I mean, what is it with, that will take even otherwise very polite Canadian citizens and have them go out rioting after a hockey game? That always just baffled me. I'm like, how does <laughs> how does this happen? But what in in your studies? I mean, is it just pure like I don't know? I mean, some of it's got to be obviously tapping into our old violent tendencies and tribalism, but I, it just it still just seems odd to me that it ever occurs and that people get so crazy. Yeah, I think you hit it on. I think you hit it. It's 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 a uh, it's something instinctual with our nature of wanting to be part of a group and then finding the power and the strength within the numbers of the group to act in ways that you wouldn't as an individual mm-hmm. and there are some interesting arguments um i was i was talking a little bit about this yesterday in one of my in my, my sociology class um talking about what's the limit of fan and uh, athlete interaction and talking about sort of what is what's appropriate in terms of fan behavior and the hostility of the crowd like you want that hostility you want a, an intense engaged aggressive crowd if you're the home yeah. team you want to intimidate terrify and rattle the <laughs> opponent although the the studies basically show that the home field advantage is a result of referees being subconsciously intimidated by the home crowd to give better calls uh, uh, which is very which is pretty interesting but uh-huh. in terms of the rioting you, you see this across all different countries in all different sports i think that there has to be a specific passion related to that sport in hockey in canada right that's it's one of the it's one of the only things Canada has that is a national identifier that both Canadians and people outside of Canada agree in some way or some shape defines, identifies, uh, and labels Canada. Mm-hmm. So we have a, a, a very irrational at times, um, <laughs> a very irrational connection <laughs> connection to this sport. And just as you see riots in um in England over soccer, right. Or, um, in, in different, different locations over, over sports that are very important to them. That's the thing that will turn Canadians kind of a little, a little mad and the game itself, right. Hockey itself is a very aggressive, violent, intense sport. Um, like if you go to watch a hockey game, uh, and you've never been, that's the thing you're going to pick up on is the, the speed, the tenacity and the way that the energy sort of pulses through the arena. And so if you're in a do or die game and uh, the last time we saw big riots in Canada over hockey was probably 2011 when Vancouver lost to Boston uh, in the Stanley Mm. final, we tend to like to riot over those. Well, Vancouver rioted twice over losing the Stanley cup Uh, in Montreal. I'm a big, I'm a big Montreal fan. Uh-huh. Uh, and and those those um, fans, if they win a playoffs like a first round playoff series, they'll go out into the streets and uh, and sometimes things will will happen. But um, yeah, I mean, it, I think it it goes to the deeper connection of the sport with the Canadian psyche, and it's something that I'm very interested in, and I I uh, I've done the historical work on that, but also have tried to track it through time, and it's just this is an activity that is uh, very near and dear to what it means to be Canadian for so many of us. And mm. it's not to say that everyone in Canada is a, is a hockey player or watches hockey, but it's the only thing that makes us sort of stop uh, all together at the same time. Like when we hosted the Olympics in 2010, we had the women's final and the men's final. The women's final drew about 50% of the Canadian population was watching it at the at one point or another wow. and the men's was two-thirds of the population. 
That's huge. I don't think you can get two thirds of the population to look at anything really ever in these days all at once. That's it's really, really rare. Yeah. So uh, it's that it's that one thing that actually does tend to unite us. Well, and whether huh. you know, whether you're a casual or whether you have no interest in the sport at any other time, it's still the thing that that tends to bring us together. It's um, one of my colleagues, I think they say it perfectly. It's the one thing that Canadians are known throughout the world for having invented and for also being the best in the world at. Uh, There's there's not much as a country that we're known (laughs) to be the best, like the absolute best at. Mm -hmm. But hockey, people know that's our, that's the sport that sort of uh, defines or helps to define part of our cultural identity. Mm. Uh, And we're really, we're really good at it. And we're just not that proficient in the international sphere and a lot of, in a lot of things. So it's, uh, it's that one, it's that one thing. And, you know, Mm. when, when you are in a small country like Canada, and especially when you are next to the United States, and we have a lot of cultural contact with the United States, um, it's nice for us to be able to step out of that shadow every once every once in a while. And yeah. uh, if there's one thing that binds Canadians together, it's the belief and the the, the desire not to be known as Americans. That's that's for sure. <laughs> and yet, it's interesting because it's one of the few sports that I can think of. I guess that that and I suppose baseball, where where you play across country lines in the same league. It's not like a special time. It's just all you guys are always in there, you know, with with Americans at the same time. Just yeah, kinda, I've, Absolutely. Yeah. And Canadians have a really rich history in baseball, too. Uh, it was probably our most played and popular sport in the entire 19th century. So there's a, a lot of there's a lot of cultural exchange between Canada and the United States. And I'm a big I, I, lo- I love I love I love that. And, uh, you know, I'm thankful yeah. that we, we have such good neighbors to the south um, that we yeah. can share a lot of a lot of culture with, you know, more so than probably any other two people's. Uh, to other countries in the world and i think that's mm-hmm. really that's that's really great and sport is one of these great ways that we cross the border with each other um, mm-hmm. so yeah. i think that, i think that's a good point nice how, just out of curiosity ha- has there ever been a riot when a canadian team's lost to another canadian team or is it very specific when they lose to somebody in the u.s <laughs> i mean like a major i i i, I don't think it's eh, it could be could be part and parcel of that i mean you see in Canada, hockey riots can start from a lot of different things. I'm not sure the anti-American thing plays plays into it. It's it's something that 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 does creep in, and I, I'm I don't I don't necessarily like like that that part sometimes of our of our national psyche. It's I think sure. it's part of um part of a what what we would call a, an inferiority complex here in, in Canada, being a small, a small country next to, uh, you know, the giant, the giant cu- culture and country in the world. Right. Uh, and so we tend to be very defensive about these things, uh, especially mm-hmm. when it comes to our cultural products and protecting them away from the Americans. But mm. um, I don't think the Canadian, that Canadians need the Americans to get riled up about hockey. We can do a pretty, <laughs> we can do a pretty good job. We can do a pretty good job just 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 within ourselves. Um, so I'm not I'm not sure that plays into it. It's certainly been yeah. a fear of Canadians uh, mm-hmm. for as long as going back to the very beginning of the game at the late 19th century. There's always been these fears that the Americans will take our take our game, change it, ruin it, uh, and leave <laughs> us leave us with nothing. Uh, right. Which I don't yeah. think is I don't think it's 100 percent warranted, but it's not also there is some there's, green. There's some. There is a, a kernel of truth to that as well. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. Well, especially if we buy up all your all your players. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, we st- we we still get the most names on our, on the on the Stanley Cup at the end of the season, and the the NHL still mm-hmm. almost fifty percent Canadian players. Um, yeah, wow. So it's still something where we 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 are overrepresented at for sure. But yeah. that's becoming less and less uh, every year. Uh, which mm-hmm. I think is probably also a good thing. The spread of the game is a good thing across the world. Yeah, well, it's good to see it doing well. I was always, when I did watch more um, team sports, the hockey was the one that I kind of stuck with for, for a while. That was mm-hmm. uh, that was a lot of fun. I used to have a, a roommate uh, 
Tim, uh, he man, he was he's high. He's still a hockey nut. Like he's the only friend I know who walks around with a jersey on. Just <laughs> whenever I'm, so yeah. it's such to me, it's a little ultra ultra obsessed. But uh, but it's uh, otherwise it's kind of funny too because otherwise he's kind of a gothy type character who's just in the you know that sort of scene and it just it always cracked me up. But he loves his <laughs> hockey and uh, but yeah, we used to sit around and just get just get wasted and play the the video game too, the old on the old Sega and stuff. And that was that oh, was yeah. a lot of fun. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean the the, the NHL ga- the the video games they're still the best in terms of all the sport games uh, for mm-hmm. sure. But what was it that sort of kept you around that game like that game as opposed to other games potentially? Because you say you're not really interested in team sports. What was question. it about? What was it about ice hockey? I, you know, I think I liked the um, I liked the speed of it. I liked that it wasn't just. I mean, yeah, there were commercials, but it wasn't as controlled by commercials as other sports. It was like, oh, no, we will break when there is a break. But it wasn't like, oh, hold on, TV time out. Or I don't know, football just sometimes would get a little bit tedious. And I'll, I'll watch just about anything if I've got friends who are into it and invite me to come check. Oh, okay, cool, I'll go watch football, tennis, whatever, I don't care. Um, but, I, yeah, I hockey was at least, it, I liked the pace of it. I did play some street hockey as a kid. I played soccer before that, but I liked actually enjoyed hockey more. Um, and, uh, yes, I don't know. I just found it, I found it really interesting. And then it definitely helped having my roommate that was, that was into it for a while. Cause that, and the getting into the video game, that was the most fun of the sports video games to play too. Yep. So it kind of kept me around it for a while. And I, I wish I still had a friend that was close by. I'd probably, I'd probably be watching it to this day. I'm, I'm back in the old, uh, days of like well it's funny because I, I loved pittsburgh was always my team for whatever reason and yep. i i checked in a little while ago like, oh how are they doing oh they win constantly i'm like, oh great because at the time it was they were always on the verge of of greatness but they never quite made it back in the yarmir yager days and stuff yep. Yep. um so but uh but yeah i don't know i just it just seems it's like a fun it's a fun sport uh a very interesting one. Uh, something cool about the the movement of it, even too. It's just like this yep. kind of they could dance of sorts. So, yeah, yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. and a little violence doesn't hurt either. I like that. <laughs> a little, a little, a little bit of the ultra violence. Yeah, a little as, bit as, of that. As they say, as they say, <laughs> as they say right? It's right. It's a little bit less than it, a little bit less than it, than it used to. Well, a lot less than it used to be. But right, they kept okay. going back and forth on allowing the fights to be televised and everything what's the ruling on that so fighting is currently i would say on its way out i don't think it's ever going to be gone from the professional nhl game the players will never allow it to go out i think that's the reason why i will i think if the league and the media had their way it would have been out a long time ago (laughs) but the players consistently it's like 98 percent of players don't want it removed yeah Uh, they use it to police. They they believe it polices the game. They believe it keeps players accountable in terms mm. of cheap shots and dirty hits and what they consider yeah. to be even more dangerous plays um, than fighting. But the NHL is yeah. slowly curbing it. They've introduced sort of minor rules um, mm. over the past decade that have really curbed the incidents of, of fighting. And fighting is currently at its lowest level, I believe, uh, in the NHL right now. Mm. Um, that's an interesting idea though that they would that they would look at it as a a way of yeah kind of making sure that you keep people in check and from not doing some total douchebag you know move and which is actually it could be a lot worse you're high sticking someone and or yeah. something like that i mean that's yeah huh yeah, that's kind of interesting yeah I, I always found it funny too how that yeah you guys would you, you know you'd see riots after hockey games but people come out of a mixed martial arts event and they're very polite and calm and <laughs> you should be, yep. never see that. I mean, I guess you don't have that element of, of any particular pride in a, in a place necessarily, but uh, yeah, I, I think if it was, if, if, if MMA was like teams, mm-hmm. then you would, you would see riots, I think, but because yeah. it's individuals and so many different individual fights on individual cards, it sort of splits the loyalties in the crowd. But yeah. if you had red team versus blue team and, you know, five fighters on team red going against five fighters, at team blue, I, I think yeah. you might start to see that kind of violence. I think it's the yeah. team. I think the team element is the thing that allows for the violence to occur sort of outside uh, of the lines or outside of the yeah. arena. 
Probably won't ever happen then, because I know they did try to do some events where it was in teams, and it I don't know, they never went over very well. People, something about that sport, it, everybody, we want to see one particular person against another particular person, and it's like a team thing gets a little weird. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, and it's 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 more difficult to organize in a, in a team sense, because it is these individual acts, right? Right. I mean, if you were to make it a team sport, you'd have to have multiple fighters at the same time. Um, yeah. I don't think that's the way that the UFC wants to go or should or should go. <laughs> no. Um, ab- absolutely. So yeah. I-, I think that individual dynamic helps to disperse the loyalties in the crowd. And that probably that probably defrays the violence or the violent impulses. Um, and also, you know, people go to the fights in order to release that aggression or that anger. And there's usually some sort of a conflict re- and there's a resolution, right? Right. At the end. Yeah. At the end, and even a controversial fight mm-hmm. is not going to elicit the same as as your team losing in a in a uh, in a heartbreaking fashion in a very important game. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that also has has something to do with it as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, transitioning over to golf a little bit, because we wanted to get into that. I one yeah. thing that I thought about with the uh, that's kind of an odd thing that's going on in in golf, because well, my instructor talks to me about it a lot, and and friend is, is that it ha- it's an interesting sport, and in that the equipment is such a is such a factor, and it almost could be a separating factor these days because they keep getting fancier and fancier, you know, equipment, but it, you know, it's very expensive, yep. um, you know, versus some of us who uh, we, I, I part of a, uh, the society of hickory golfers too, which is a whole nother thing where we only play with really old, like hundred year old clubs yep. or at least clubs that are made now with certain particular rules. You can't, yep. you can't have them do certain things. And, but it's, I, I can't think of any other sport that has that going on where it's starting to lead into this weird technological assisted area where you could start at some point probably questioning well is the player the the thing anymore is it you know how much of this is the equipment doing the the job and how much is the player yeah yeah absolutely golf is the technology is going it's it's improving at such a rapid a rapid pace and i think i think that's actually a pretty good thing because it allows the the beginner the amateur golfer to play with a level of competence that was um beyond them now for the pros i think that you're right you do run into a really big issue with uh with their performance levels when it comes to these um these technological advancements and and mainly the way that i see it being detrimental is it's changing the way that golf courses themselves are being constructed yes uh longer and longer and even with one of these brand new clubs that allows you to hit straighter and longer than you ever would and it's actually less so the clubs than it is the balls like the balls Mm. are just they are like spring-loaded rockets that just fly forever and bounce and roll and spin and um (laughs) and when you get someone as proficient as a professional with that it's it it means that the golf courses that were constructed to be difficult are no longer difficult so in order Mm -hmm. to allow the course to then be difficult for these pros everybody is going longer and that doesn't help the 99% of golfers who don't hit over 300 yards. Yeah. Over probably 99.9% of golfers that can't hit over 300 yards like the pros. So I would I would like to see something like what they do in Major League Baseball where they don't allow the players to use the best equipment. Mm-hmm. Major, League, Major League players, when they bat, have to use wooden bats. They're not allowed to use aluminum. They're not allowed to use carbon fiber. They're not allowed to use any of these brand new technologies. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mainly it's a safety thing. Like you can't, you don't want, you don't want a ball being rocketed off an aluminum bat. I mean, they, (laughs) they can come off the bat at like 107 miles an hour with a wood bat. (laughs) So like you can just imagine with, so I, I would be pretty happy with limiting the equipment that the professionals can use. Yeah. I think it would be interesting. Mm -hmm. I think it would make it more interesting. Um, I think it would show the players to be a little bit more vulnerable. I think it would include a lot more strategy into the game, which is, I think, a lost art of it. Uh, and that's something that I'm, I'm really uh, studying right now, actually. Mm. Uh, but that would be my solution. I would say keep the technology for everybody but the pros because it makes the game more enjoyable, more fun. And, and I wouldn't say it's easier it does make the game a little bit easier, but I mean, golf's not easy. Even if you have, even if you can, even if you can hit the ball once in a while, straight and long, I mean, you're not consistently going to do that if you're not a, 
if you're not a scratch golfer. So I don't right. see tech. I don't see technology as detrimental except for what it's doing at the, the margin. Yeah. 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 I agree. And I, I know my, yeah, my coach, whatever friend, he, he's, he, he's very concerned with it because he sees it going on. He used to be a pro and, and, um, you know, it, it just watching these old courses get either torn up or completely changed. And, you know, where, where does it end? You know, and, and at some point too, I would also think that would affect the cost for the rest of us too, because they're going to have to keep making them bigger and bigger. And all of a sudden, what is that? That's going to take more money and more space and water, all that, you know, and, and it's going to start making it even more expensive, which I think is unfortunate because it's, it's a great game, but it is still, even at the cheaper courses, it's, you know, it's, it's not cheap. And then the equipment costs some money and, yep. you know, it, it, I mean, it, it's, I'm, I don't, I don't need it to be dirt cheap. That's fine. But it's, but yeah, it, there's a point where it gets to be prohibitively expensive and not, I don't know. And just without reason, I, I would rather play a game where I'm more concerned with um, fundamentals and strategy and enjoying the course than going, okay, wow. All right. I better get, yeah, the best driver and make sure I can get it 300 yards out on the first hit every time. Yeah. And that's just, I don't know. It's, it's not, at some point too, it's going to reach the limits of human sight where we're just all going to be losing balls more often. Cause yeah. you know, I don't know after a couple hundred yards, it's real hard for me to keep track of where the hell that thing came down. Oh yeah, so. ab absolutely. It's, it's very tricky. And, um, Uh, the, the sort of the 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 i guess in the in the the sort of the picture of golf um because there's lots of different philosophies or strategies on how to maximize your game right but one of the most intriguing things and i i just started researching um architecture because one of the most the most famous canadian golf course architect his archives are held at a university that's um, very close to me so i started doing some research there uh and i'm and as a golfer, I'm very interested in that that part of the game because I think when you start to focus on the course instead of focusing on your game, it, it opens up this whole new way of viewing and interacting with the sport and especially your performance. And it brings in the element of intelligence and of strategy and of thinking about how do I maximize my physical potential with the the um, opportunities that are afforded to me with the way that this hole or this course is is laid out. Uh, and it allows you to play within your game, but also allows you to do well. Uh, and so you're not focusing on doing the things that you can't do or that the course is maybe trying to trick you into doing. <laughs> you yes. sort of, uh, and that's and that's part of a good, that's part of a good uh, golf course. Um, the golf architects, and there's been many different schools of architecture, but the the courses that are consistently rated the most enjoyable the most fun always have this element of strategy that's involved right you're presented with numerous possibilities in terms of how you can play a shot no matter if you're a proficient golfer or you're a scrap or you're a duffer like you you're just a terrible player mm -hmm. um the good course should provide everybody the options and the alternatives to try and maximize their talent and so when you start to focus on the way that the course is actually set up, I feel like that that is a really intriguing way to get at the nature of the sport itself. And it's one of the things that also differentiates golf from all other sports is the field of the, the actual physical field of play in golf is is it's so different from what you encounter in all different sports. Uh, and so I've been really focusing on the way that these courses are constructed the way that they're supposed to evoke feelings uh, and experiences within the player uh, and how and how the sort of the natural features and architecture and setting and the aesthetics of the course uh, all play into this. And this is something that these golf course architects from the late 19th century and sort of the 19th. 10s, 20s, and 30s, what they call the gold, the golden era. I think I've said that a bunch of times about sports. Um, <laughs> the golden era, they call the golden era of golf architecture. Um, and mm -hmm. that's what these architects were really focused on. And it was a um, a revulsion. It was a, a reaction against what happened um, when they started to build courses inland. Um, the, the original golf courses were all built at the coast in Scotland and in England uh, uh, mm -hmm. because of yeah. the topographical nature uh, and the way that um, that that particular landscape lent itself to the right conditions mm -hmm. and um, I talked about stand like 
the thing with modern sport is it's standardized, right? Well, a lot of the 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 next wave of people who started to build courses, especially in America, they they did um, they did so in what's called now the penal school, where it's kind of a punishing course. Uh, so, all the all the all the holes are essentially the same. They're made by professionals so that when they hit their perfect shots, they're rewarded. So you get <laughs> things like straight lines in terms of fairways. You get square bunkers, rectangular bunkers, square greens. Um, coffin bunkers, cross bunkers, but always placed at the same distances so that for professionals, this was mm -hmm. their, their course, right? Uh, yeah. You hit long and straight or else you don't, you don't get to play and it punishes you. Mm -hmm. But for, for the most players, that's not exciting. It's not enjoyable and it looks hideous. They would, they would have yeah. these grotesque and artificial features. And so the next wave of architects came in and they wanted to go back to that sort of idea of a natural setting for golf. Mm -hmm. The golf course should blend into the environment. It should evoke a sense of awe, excitement, but also a little bit of terror in the player. Uh, and they really focused on the setting, right? That the golf course is the setting that provides the meaningful experiences of golf. Uh, and the more I play and the more I walk golf courses, I find that to be 100% a, a, a true. Um, yeah. It doesn't necessarily matter how you're playing. It's... It's what you're doing when you're walking down that fairway and you're thinking about that next shot and maybe there's a, a beautiful vista that you're looking at, right? And it's that, mm -hmm. that combination of factors that I think makes golf such a truly uh, special kind of a, a sport that's so different that's so different from uh, from the other sports that we generally participate in. Yeah, it really is. I mean, it's such a it's an interesting thing. Once I got into it, I'm like, well, this is like playing a sport, but in a big Zen garden. I mean, it's it's so it's so interesting that way and the feelings that you can get, especially if you, yeah, you don't get too obsessed on your game. I, it always baffles me when I, I mean, I, I, it's not that I never get upset at a shot, but I, I never really get angry necessarily. Like not, you know, not really. I get disappointed in myself. I go, ah, oh, that sucks. What a bummer. But I, yeah. you know, the worst day of golf, it's still a wonderful day. I mean, you have in this beautiful place and it, I don't know. It, it's great. I think the only times I get truly frustrated is maybe when I'm being rushed through, if anything, which, yeah, is a, is a bit of a problem with the sport because it is expensive to, to run a course so they try to keep people moving through as quickly as possible but i tell you one thing i'd do if i had ungodly sums of money is i would probably rent out bumpers like buffers of time between me and other groups just so I could <laughs> really just walk a course and take my sweet time going from one place yep. to the other because some of them are just so amazing and beautiful and you're going oh my god i just want to sit here for a few minutes and enjoy this view or something you know and it's yep. uh yeah, it's just really, it's really incredible, but it's a very, yeah, it is a very interesting sport like that. And you, you definitely learn about a lot in relation to all that, uh, learn a lot about yourself playing golf that, I mean, in any sport you can learn a lot, but it's, I think golf gives you a lot of time and space where it's very, very obvious. If you're in a mentally not well put together state, oh, it's yeah. going to come out really hard <laughs> and anybody with a fragile ego or, or just any kind of issue whatsoever, you can see that so fast on the course playing. With it's, people. It reveals your character. Um, absolutely. And it's funny um, because Sometimes the experiences on the golf course are, are I mean, because you're you're playing in a non-real space, right? That's the, also the part is you're sort of divorced from 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 the outside distractions. Mm -hmm. um, but the real emotions that you feel in a round, like, are some of the most intense things um, that you might experience in sport. Like hitting a bad shot is one thing, but hitting four bad shots in a row, like <laughs> that's oh. true. You know, like you, you don't even <laughs> think you, you don't even think that you care that much. And then all of a sudden this well of anger or rage gets into you and, uh, <laughs> and you have to, you have to control it. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah. Most golfers have, have displayed poor character uh, on the golf course at one point or another. And you look back and you think, why was I so angry? Why was I so upset uh, about, you know, hitting a, a tiny little white ball uh, into, into a lake, right? right. That's, that. And then you start to blame, well, why did they have to put that there, right? Why did they have to put that right in the... the... But yep. again, focusing on the course or focusing more, not so much on, on your immediate performance, but more of the mindset of, of how you should be approaching the game, I think it allows you to, to again, it's a test. It's a mental test. Golf is... Golf is such a, a great experience for testing yourself. I, I, I say that it's the one sport where on 18 holes, you know for sure you're going to visit heaven and hell multiple times. 
Mm-hmm. You're definitely going to, and you're definitely going to, you're definitely going to hell a lot more often than you are going to heaven. But it's those yeah. moments of 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 hitting the right shot at the right time with the right outcome that that keeps you back coming back. Yeah. You can shoot a you can shoot a one forty, right, which is a terrible score because uh, yeah. that's like that's like double par, which is which yeah. is fine. And if you shoot one forty, oh, yeah. hey, keep keep going out there, right? Yeah. Um, but it's it's not a it's not a great score. But if you shoot one hundred and thirty eight of those strokes are are what are, are maybe bad swings, but you mm-hmm. have two really great shots, you'll you'll come back. You'll come back out to the golf course. Yeah. To try and recapture the moment, that feeling you get when you connect, and your aim is right, and your execution is right, and it all comes together, and it's just this, this poetic moment, uh, and it, it it's like a drug, and that's why people go out mm. to the course. It's to try to get to those those transcendent moments where your action, the representation of it through the ball and the outcome of where it lands, all all combine into this this moment. And um, I think even the lexicon of golf, right? They call that hitting a pure shot, mm, right? yes. or hitting it, tr- or hitting it true. Uh, mm-hmm. And you you feel you feel that. Um, and certainly yeah. when you hit a bad shot, uh, it, it it feels it, it feels like you're going to a bad. It feels like you're going to a bad place, and you're going fast. And you yeah. gotta fig- you gotta figure out yourself <laughs> how how to, how to get out of it because you know uh, I I've, I've been on courses with players uh, and people. Who will walk off the course? Mm. It, it's too much for them. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah the frustration levels takes takes them over. And these mm-hmm. are people that are that play. Uh, so you can yeah. even have a, a scratch golfer, and and that's another thing I like about golf is even mm-hmm. with our relative skill differences, mm-hmm. everybody lives in a certain degree of relative hell with uh, their games. Yes. So even if you shoot one twenty or one forty. And you think, well, I would kill to be the guy that can shoot 70. Well, that guy who shoots 70, he wants to shoot 65. Mm-hmm. Right. right. Like he's he's living in his own <laughs> type, type of hell where he can't execute. And he's and he's having trouble. So even yeah. though we have vast skill differences, we all experience the same feelings of, of uh, adulation or, oh, that was a routine shot. Or, oh, my goodness, how could I have possibly made such a bad mistake or such a bad swing? Mm-hmm. And it's sort of allows even the really bad players to play with the really good players and to sort of understand at least on some level yeah. to have that that connection um, yeah no absolutely yeah I, I played uh recently i had a big outing with the the, the shivas iron sort of club that's i don't know if you ever read golfing in the kingdom but you should check out that book if you haven't it kind of mixes yeah mythology and golfing a bit um yep. but uh, but there's a whole group kind of a fan club group from that book that put together and we went out to band and dunes but i mean we had people ranging from yeah pretty much scratch golfers all the way up to you know myself who's at like a 28 handicap or something and yeah. uh and it was but it was a lot it was a lot of fun it, it was very interesting to me to, to see though that usually the ones that had the worst time and were the most pissed off were generally the guys that were closest to scratch because every little thing just kills them. Whereas me, I was just happy to even be able to keep up. I'm like, man, if I can just not hold up the entire group of hitting it off into the woods, I'm going to be having a good day. So (laughs) it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting to see that how it's hard to, sometimes it's very hard to appreciate your own skill level and how you're doing once you in, in the sport. Cause it really does. It somehow seems to push you to always, Oh, I just a little bit better. I got that score last time. Now I can, I can just get back to that. And <laughs> it's a tough, yeah, thing. that's, that's the insanity of golfers, right? Yeah. This, this yeah. round's going to be the best round. And that's, yeah. that's also one of the reasons why people go back out. It's because of that potential, like the potential on the golf course is every time you're out there. And I think this was mentioned in the the podcast you did with your, your trainer, right? He mentioned mm. that I thought it was a great point. Every time you step out on the first tee, you have the potential to, to do your best ever. Yeah. Right? That's you have true. the potential to set a new, per, a new personal best. And that's, I think what also really frustrates you. Sometimes mm-hmm. you, you play your best golf after you've given up. Yeah. <laughs> you that's know, true. like, you start the first couple of holes and oh geez, like I'm already way off the pace. I'm never gonna get that best score. I'm never gonna hit that record today. And so mm-hmm. you kind of get relaxed, and then all of a sudden you're uh, you get you get into that zone. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 such a it's a game that's so dependent on your mental state, and your mental state fluctuates so frequently within the round and even on a hole. Like you can go from different a different you can be in a different mental oh, yeah. state every time you step over the you you step up to the ball and you step over it depending on your previous shot um yeah and that's why 
and just to link it to sort of a physicality because people will often not talk about golf as a physical or like a real kind of a sport mm -hmm. uh but but that's because they look at people riding around in carts and drinking beer right um sure. Which is a great way to spend an afternoon, no doubt. But <laughs> yeah. I, I prefer walking the course. I, I think too. that's the I think that's the real essence of golf. And certainly, with yeah. you, you go back to the originators, right in Scotland. Um, they 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 abhor cart like getting in a cart. For them, golf sure. must be it must be walked. And I I, yeah. I think the pace of the game is very important when you're walking as opposed to a cart, right? Because you need mm -hmm. that time to walk up to your shot. You need the time to visualize where your next shot's going to be. You need that time to maybe forget about what you just did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whereas yes. if you're in a cart and you hit a bad shot, well, now you're standing over your ball like a minute later and you've got to recuperate. And it's um, you don't have that that pacing and that timing of the sport. Um, yeah. And when you're walking, it's an extremely, I wouldn't say it's high intensity, but if you walk, carry a bag or push a bag, by the end of your round, you're going to be physically drained. You're going to be tired. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I don't think people who have, I think people who have never done that can't appreciate, can't appreciate uh, the physic, the physicality that it takes and the, uh, the endurance and in particular, the mental concentration that you have to have over the entire length of the, the round, which could be three and a half to five, five and a half hours, depending, hopefully it's not five, five or more hours, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's, <laughs> oh yeah, we've all, we've, yeah. we've, we've, we've all, we've all been there. Yeah. There. And, and that's that's when you might get the most frustrated is when your 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 pace is is not there uh, yeah. and it's gonna the, throw you off your game so it all kind of link it all kind of links up with the importance of the course too right because the walking element in the beautiful areas in the beautiful settings that are meant to evoke potential but also like a little bit of fear um if you're not walking the course you're missing out on 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 that important connection between player and playing field uh, as well yeah. so I would, I would implore people who've never tried it um mm -hmm. maybe don't start with 18 because that's a surefire way you'll never go out again but certainly go out and try like a nine hole maybe a short course an executive course a par three course but mm -hmm. walk you know carry your clubs walk the walk the walk the course go with somebody where you're not going to be worried about holding up or yeah. or i I think that's what drives a lot of people away from the game is their first experience is on a championship course, 18 in a foursome with people who've played and then they're, they, you know, they're taking, yeah, they're getting in. They're, they're just taking they're way too impatient. many shots and, and, mm -hmm. and it's frustrating and you give up and then yeah. you never, you never want to go back. And I don't blame those people. It's something you have to kind of get eased into a little bit, but once you're there, you can see how rewarding of an activity it is. Um, yeah, so Absolutely. I just wanted I, I, I just want to get people to understand that the game itself offers so much from a personal perspective in terms of physical uh, attributes and health uh, to mental to, to the to mental training uh, yeah. and this notion of, of, of appreciating nature and natural settings. And mm -hmm. so I think that as a sport, golf really does bring in all these different elements that, that no other sport really can provide. Uh, mm -hmm. And I would like to see it more. I'd like to see it more widespreadly played. Uh, yeah, because I think it gets a bad. And I think there are there are legitimate reasons. You talked about the cost, and it is prohibitive, sure. prohibitively expensive. But in places like um, Scotland, it doesn't. It's it's gone back and forth between being an elite game and being sort of a working class sport as well. Mm -hmm. And it's it's something that everybody does. Um, and so there is a democratic egalitarian history to the sport as well. Like, for example, in Nova Scotia, in Canada, right, um, which mm -hmm. is Latin for, for New Scotland. So there's a lot of Scots um, mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. They do not have private courses in, New, in yeah. New, Nova, Nova Scotia. There are, uh, was it New Brunswick? There are none. Like, there are prestigious courses, but there are no closed off private enclaves where only members are allowed. And that's the same in Scotland. They huh. do not have they do not have private clubs. They have clubs that you can become a member of, but they're always open to the public. So oh, that might be cool. that might be a way of thinking about it that's different. Because in you know when we think about golf in North America, we think about the country club and the the members only and and uh, yeah and those sorts of things, which is certainly true. But but that's not the whole that's not the whole story and history and and legacy of the sport either. Um, yeah.
But. Yeah, absolutely. And I think some places are certainly making it more accessible. I mean, we're very, I'm very lucky where I'm at and that all of our courses are at least, uh, yeah, open to the public, even though exactly you can have a membership and all that and they get preferential treatment for certain times. But other than that, it's, yeah, it's, it's open. And then we have a public course, which uh, I'm sure you probably heard me talk about on the podcast, but um, yeah, where it's just, I mean, very casual and there's everybody from pot smoking, you know, punk rockers out there to, you know, to whatever people and, you know, dress up nice and still playing and you know yep. a little more professionally and uh, so it's it, it's a neat thing to see and I think it's interesting thing to see too how it's the, the culture's kind of trying to work itself out a little bit because I as much as I can understand like, I can understand both sides it's like I can understand the sort of elitist thing of like well we don't want to just let everybody in here because then they're going to be you know making they're, they're going to be loud at the wrong times or you know doing things having behavior that's going to distract us from this nice peaceful meditative game uh, you know, whereas at the other side, I, you know, excluding people because they don't have the right type of collared shirt on. I'm like, eh, I don't really, it gets, a, that's where you get into that snooty old attitude where all the, especially in the 1980s, all the golfing people are, you know, these ter- terrible, horrible snooty jerks or like a happy Gilmore kind of situation or something. Yep. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time too, I don't like to see like, if it happy to get more be an example again like i almost don't like the crowds that get like that where they're they're yelling things out they're yelling out baba booey after every shot at a professional course at a game like oh, yeah. i don't really i don't like that either so like okay how can we come to some sort of yeah. you know nice little little medium where we can keep it keep the things that are nice and meditative and pleasant about the about the game but still yeah not be elitist about it either and just as long as you follow some basic you know, manners and, and, uh, civility, you can, and anybody should be able to get out there. But yeah, I, I, I hope, I hope to get it out to more people and I'm certainly going to be having, uh, more talks with, with my instructor, Bob and, and, uh, you know, and, and people like yourself just to kind of actually, I've got a guy who, um, wrote a book called Zen golf too, which he, he didn't really want to title it that, but his publisher sort of pushed him that way. <laughs> uh, but, uh, Dr. Joseph parent, he's a, he's an interesting guy too, brings kind of a, Eastern uh, methodology to uh, okay, golf yeah. teaching and and mental state in particular out there, and he's he's a fun guy too. I'm gonna have uh, have him on pretty soon, so that'll be fun. Because I think it's such a it's such a neat thing that I I put it out for so long for so many years. I thought, oh, this is some ridiculous thing. My father wanted me to get into it. I never understood it and just didn't get it. But if you get out there, you know, and you get with some people that you like and set and settings important, just like tripping on acid or something. And oh yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, you go out with some good people and it's uh, it's just one of the most fun times I've I've ever had. I I, I love it. Such a such a great thing. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't 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 have said it. Couldn't have said it. Uh, uh, couldn't have said it any better. Yeah. What what got? How did you run into it? Because it being a, it, I noticed oddly enough a lot of hockey people. Matter of fact, my well, you probably heard. Yeah, my instructor he used to he was a hockey guy. That was his thing. Yep. And for some reason, hockey people tend to be good at golf too. Uh, but what what is what is that? Or how did you find it? Uh, I found it. Um, I was lucky. Um, we lived. Uh, where I lived in in Ontario, the city had uh, a couple of good public courses, and so as a junior, they offered you a pretty good, a pretty reasonable rate. It was you could buy sort of like a half membership as a as a junior for less than one hundred and fifty bucks, and it got you sort of half price green fees. So it became pretty affordable, and uh, uh, my friend my friends were doing it. So I started playing when I was uh, twelve, thirteen. My 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 dad played a little bit, but the, the circle of friends he was with played quite a bit. It, it just his work schedule didn't really, he was really busy with his work in the summer. So he didn't have a chance to really get serious into it. Yeah. Uh, but they thought that this would be a good place, you know, for, you know, it's a great place to drop off. You know, you drop off your, your 12 year olds, 13 year olds at the course, you, they run around for, you know, four hours playing. Um, right. It's a little bit of independence, <laughs> but it's also supervised and, you know, you can't, yeah. you can't, you can't break too many of the rules, but it's, it's, it was just that great time getting out with friends and I got a few lessons and then, um, I went away from the game for about, uh, 10 years, uh, for a bunch of other reasons. Uh, all my money went into music. I, I tried to, mm. I was, I was a musician for, for a while, uh, playing, played different sports and just didn't have any of the disposable income to really mm-hmm. get into it. And then, um, in 2013 or 12 yeah 2013 i think it was um my wife um through her work we were able to get a um a trip uh, because she was such a high performer at her company we were able to get a trip 
uh, out to Hawaii and one of the activities yeah. was play, was playing golf. And yeah, so cool. I got I got brand new clubs. Uh, we played on this beautiful course in the middle of a lava field. And nice. uh, and uh, I, I actually ended up beating the president of her company, which didn't make him very which didn't make him very happy. Uh, and that uh-huh. sort of re- that sort of re-sparked my love for the game because I was thinking, oh, I remember how much fun this was, and I, I actually haven't lost a lot of the skill that I have. Although I was, I'm never really, I'm not, a, I'm not a great golfer by any means. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have a very low handicap or or anything like that. Um, if you but get I can hit it all can... after that much time. That's that's yeah. good. Yeah, that's something. <laughs> uh, but in terms of why are hockey players good at golf, or why does it seem? I think in Canada, it's the rhythm of the seasons, right? You cannot mm. play golf in the winter here. Like it's just yeah. it's, it's just ice and it's snow and it's cold, and so yeah. you play hockey. But the second it thaws out, right? Hockey season's over, mm. and the natural summer sports that that lend well to the skills of hockey or baseball uh, and golf when you think about hand-eye coordination and striking and mm-hmm. so th- there's a good transfer um there's a good transfer in terms of the skills that are required in in, in one sport and the other but it's it's the rhythm of the seasons really i think when it comes to hockey players you know it just once once the ice is gone then the grass is up and so it's now time to 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 get into that summer sport and it's it's the camaraderie as well when you're on the course with your friends. It mimics yeah. the camaraderie of the locker room, and you yeah. can you can bet, you can you can have jokes, um, mm-hmm. you can have beer, a beer or two. So yeah. it, it just provides that 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 continuum, right, of what you're getting in terms of fraternity, mm-hmm. but you also get that skill, the contest, the competition, all those things that athletes really. Uh, are driven by so you can get that all in in the sport and it's not something if you're like a high level hockey player it's not something you're going to get injured really playing either right you have to protect sure. yourself and so for for players like for the for the pros right i mean this is mm-hmm. the one thing that they that they can that they can do i'm sure that uh, that they're allowed to based, <laughs> based on insurance and stuff yeah right um, there are things in their contracts that say you can't do this you can't do that um mm-hmm. So yeah. I'm sure that's one of the things that they're allowed to do. So there's probably there's probably a whole bunch of reasons, but I, I think the rhythm of the seasons is something that's probably the biggest. That's sort of the biggest thing when it comes when mm-hmm. it comes to when it comes to that. I mean, we're especially up in uh, in here uh, in Canada, we are dominated by the seasons. Right T- tomorrow, it's going to be the first day of spring, and I've still got you know a couple of feet of snow in my backyard. Although my front yard's starting to uh, with so where the sun mostly hits, it's starting to to thaw out a, li- a little bit and. Uh, mm-hmm. I was driving home and I passed one golf course on my drive. Well, I passed a number, but one I passed and it, it was, it was like the ice and the snow was finally starting to melt. And I woke up this morning and there's a whole new blanket of snow. So it's just, uh, <laughs> it's just one, it's just one of, it's just one of those, the, one of those things. And so I think the rhythm of this, I, I would say rhythm of the seasons for sure. Yeah. That's an interesting thing. Yeah. We don't have to, well, at least where I'm at now, we don't suffer as much from that. Although this year it was, it's been so rainy that it's actually been too soaked to really get out there. But, but, uh, but yeah, mostly we can play darn near all year, all year round here practically. So it's a, uh, it's, it's a different sort of thing, but, uh, but yeah, it, it is, it, it, it still is, is regulated somewhat obviously on how the day is and how you like the weather, I suppose. So yeah, yeah you kind of want to get out there when it's not too hot or too cold or too crazy wind and it's yeah it's a certain certain thing you're kind of kind of going for and it's uh yeah yeah it's a really neat thing when everything lines up though it's uh it's amazing i i was i was surprised how tolerable it was even in somewhat cooler weather um we went out when i went out to bandon dunes out in oregon and it's just such a beautiful course that even when it was kind of cold i I just, it's multiple courses, but, um, yeah. but it, it just, it was so enjoyable. It was like, I just kind of, everything went out of my mind. I wasn't worried that it was 10 degrees cooler than I would normally be at all comfortable with. It was just so, yeah. so amazing, such a magical place to be, yeah. to be playing. So, um, and that sort of cold, dreary, gray, I mean, <laughs> that's, that's the environment that the game was created in, right? That's that's the Scottish True. that's that's the Scottish coast, and it's a uh, it's wild out there in terms of weather. And the locals, they don't they don't mind that they don't mind that they play year round. Um, yeah, and that's some tough. of the there's some <laughs> there's even some there's there's some unfortunate historical stories about people playing in, in bad weather uh, and and succumbing uh, to to sort of the the consequent the consequences of that. Um, like personally, when I'm because the weather can be so variable around here, 
um, and we don't have a long playing window. Right. My my uh, my philosophy on playing in weather is: Would a Scottish person play in this? <laughs> yeah. And if they if, if it's yes, it's like ah oh, okay yeah. <laughs> okay we'll go and, we'll go we'll go and, we'll go and play. So, um, yeah. I try to think, and that's something I try to think about. I mean, as a historian, it's something that comes natural to my uh, sort of thinking. But I always think about the legacy, where the game come from, came from, what it meant to those people, and how they interacted and played with it. And I try to, I try to bring that perspective with me when I come to the course and and playing through inclement weather sometimes, uh, p- part and parcel. I mean, within re- within reason, within sure. reason, you have to be safe. Um, sure. you know, I'm not going to be like uh, Bill Murray and Caddyshack and playing in the thunder and the lightning, right. no, I... but, uh, <laughs> but yeah. if it's, if it's reasonable, you know, um, you'll, yeah. you'll, you'll see a few of us, you'll see a few of us crazy, crazy people out there, uh, in a, in a, in a, in a, on a bad day. So, uh, yeah. so that, that romance <laughs> as well is something that I think is, is, is something that's alluring and very, very important to the game of golf as well. The lineage and the, and the history and the tradition. Uh, not in the elitist sort of sense, but in the um, more in the original sort of Scottish sense of it. Uh, yeah. As, as a as a test. Uh, yes. The game, the, the game, the game as a as a as a test, uh, and as also sort of a civic engagement. Um, mm. Certainly, if you look at a town like St Andrews, which is exists essentially because of golf. Yeah. 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 That's, that was a big, big thing. Yeah, I definitely, I think I, I test it more on the, uh, myself more on the, the heat side than the cool side. I've definitely, I played in that and it's, and it, it is interesting the first day when we were at Bandon Dunes and we played the old McDonald's course, which is the most like a Scottish course, probably of the, yeah. of them. That was the day we had the weather that was truly like Scottish weather. So that was, that was kind of fun. The other days we had most, it was mostly clear and I enjoyed that as well, but, uh, it, it is interesting. I like going out when it's the other thing nice about going out with extreme weather, whether it's heat or cold as you do get it gets less crowded often so i'll go out here my thing is i don't mind the heat so i'll go i don't care if it's 103 and i'm like all right i'll go out just you know sweat it off and it's kind of <laughs> i'll just walk a little slower you know have more yep. drinks or something but yep. yeah i kind of i kind of enjoy that but it's completely different from anything you'd experience in the original game i'm sure <laughs> oh the yeah the heat the heat is the heat is bad i was in north carolina a few years ago playing in uh playing in Pinehurst and it was so hot on one of the days we were playing Pinehurst number one and it was so hot that the locals weren't playing golf. We said, no, it's too, it's too, too hot for the locals down in North Carolina. So <laughs> probably humid too. That yeah, help. yeah. Yeah. It was an, it was a nice feeling because I did get to shoot under the degree, uh, the, the temperature in Fahrenheit, uh, even, even though I didn't break a hundred that day, I still got to break the, I still shot lower than the, than the temperature, which was, I like that. That, that was an accomplishment. <laughs> that was an accomplishment. <laughs> I, I didn't have, I didn't have my best game that day either. So it was, uh, yeah. it, you know, you always try to find those little bit of moral victories every time you're out too, which is, which is nice. You don't have to f- always focus on the whole part. You know, I'm yeah. always looking just to hit a few good shots, put a few good consecutive holes together yeah uh and that 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 that's enough for me that'll keep me coming back out every time oh yeah it's always nice and you never know when something something magical is going to happen on any old shot i had one of my worst games ever was when i i got a hole in one i wasn't even i was playing like crap i was about ready to just go eh, maybe i should just call it and get because the family had just showed up to get you know say hi and they hopped in the card and i went oh, okay and so uh it was just yeah it was a lazy day and 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 man i just i don't know one just went in it was like oh wow i would have i would have just given up and walked off or something and and for the day i wouldn't have had that that moment so it was kind of still wasn't a great scorecard in the end but who cares yeah it's, oh it's you got fun the, you, you got the solo like that's that's a, that's amazing. Yeah. That's one of that's one of my life goals is to hit a hole in one at one point. <laughs> it's I, it's amazing how I mean the odds of it. I guess because yeah, I I hit one in and then you know the guy who owns the course was like, did you just really did you? Because he didn't see it. Luckily, I'm glad my wife and kid were there. Otherwise, nobody would have believed me. But yeah, <laughs> yeah so he it's came like over the, fish, the fish that got away. Yeah, exactly. And he was he was really surprised. He's never hit one. He's been playing golf you know thirty years. And I went, God, you'd think by now. I I mean, yeah, I don't know. I I guess it'd be cheating to sit there on your own course and just sit at the same hole and keep hitting them at they're like the driving range but uh, i I would attempt to (laughs) it's not that's not a real hole in one though and that's the other that's that's the other that's the other fun thing about golf is you can it's the easiest game to cheat in by Mm. far you can cheat on your score you can cheat by moving your ball players don't keep track of what other players are doing right 
So it really comes down to your honesty level, right? And mm-hmm. yeah, you can fake the score, but you know what you've done personally. Yeah. And you know when you earn something and you don't, right? And you get that sort of feeling of accomplishment when you when you do really earn it. And you don't have that sense of, of accomplishment when you cheat. Uh, and that goes for anything in life, right? Sure. Uh, so yeah. golf is, again, this ultimate test of, well, how honest will you be? Not just with your other players, but with yourself. Because you can easily trick yourself into rationalizing well that that stroke you know i was a little flustered so maybe i'll just take another one and no one needs to know mm-hmm. sort of, it's very it's so easy it's so yep. easy to to do that and we all are guilty of it and that's why yeah. i think that's another reason why people don't like it because the rules are strict enough that you cannot escape your mistakes like <laughs> you can <laughs> like you can in other sports so yep. it's that's another thing why people get so angry uh, at the sport and why it's so easy to just, you know, uh, to cheat to yeah. or to mo- or to modify any any part of the game uh, to make it bend more towards how you want it to go. Oh, yeah. But in the end, but in the end, you know that you know that's you know what you've done. Sure. Uh, and, you, and you can't and you can't run away from that. Uh, yeah. Very, very, pres- very Presbyterian. Right. Golf takes on a lot of that <laughs> sure. Scottish religiosity. Um, within its within its fabric and its makeup, um, which I, uh, is another reason I think I, it's it's very interesting. It is, yeah, and I, I it it's I, one of the few sports too. Well, not few, but I, it's the sport where I see the most um, the the highest amount of um, uh, of superstition and mythology and religion all put into place because people will you know they'll pray to anything or or start getting you know <laughs> very oddly superstitious about stuff. You're going, are you like some pretty hardcore atheist scientist? You know, but they will start you know blaming anything for bad stuff or 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 yeah praying to gods they don't believe in just to make a shot and it's 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 amusing to yeah. to watch how it evokes that out it's almost like it, revo- it evokes a religiousness out of you especially when you get a, a well a good shot or a bad shot but often it's the good ones yeah. where you go how is that even possible it's just this miracle of this little tiny ball going hundreds of yards or something and you know Absolutely. into a little hole or whatever and there's there's something that's just beyond normal rational understanding sometimes that it takes on yeah, absolutely. That's why I use the that's why I use the metaphors of going to heaven and hell because it's real. Like that's a re yeah. you can re you really you really do go to those places on the golf course. Like, and you and as you say, like atheists, non believers. You know, I've got atheist friends who play the game, and they will they will you know they don't believe in gods, but they believe in the golf gods. Yeah, and they believe in the karma that the golf gods will give. You know, if you if you cheat a little on one hole, you're gonna get it back the next like the next hole in in spades so Mm -hmm. it is it it does have this unique ability to evoke the transcendent uh, or the metaphysical Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, again maybe more so maybe more so than other sports although you know people who are passionate about other sports may make may make the arguments but i don't know if it's i don't know if it's quite as apparent as it as it is in golf and how intense and real it is um, for people yeah. who aren't even invested or interested in the sport, they can certainly get those experiences anytime they go out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. It's an interesting uh, thing that way. I know when um, when I was doing like jujitsu more often, Brazilian jujitsu, you definitely could get into that sort of flow meditative state that that was that was really interesting. And but it but you didn't. I, I don't know. It still didn't. There's something different about golf that really, and maybe it's because you have more time to think and process, or yeah, you're not constantly under a, a physical uh, any. There's no there's no opponent coming at you, so it's really yeah. just you have to kind of go internal and uh, yeah. So it evokes some different different things that uh, that you just don't get with other sports. Yeah, yeah, it's the most internally mental kind of sport that's based upon mindset. You know, as we were talking about before, yeah. like it's it's. It's the it's one of the least physically dependent sports, and one of the ways you can think about that is the difference of golf instruction, right? Which I think is mm. what you and Bob were talking about as well in that other that other podcast. You have some golf instructors who focus on the technical elements, right? There's like 64 different separate movements in a golf swing, and there's people who will try to fine tune each one of those 64 motions. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the wrong way to approach the sport. The more yeah. valuable way to approach the sport is mindset. Play within your game. Play in a way that's comfortable and natural to you, right? Mm-hmm. And and focus more on the mental aspect as opposed to the technical way in which your body is actually moving. Because there's a naturalness to a swing, 
and to everybody's swing who swings differently. All you have to do is watch uh, the PGA Tour and look at how vastly different all those swings are. Yeah. People with a textbook beautiful swing to somebody like a Jim Furyk who has one of the most ugly looking things you've ever seen, <laughs> or like a or like a Bryson DeChambeau who's like an old school vertical stance straight up, like as close to the ball as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, or you, and you contrast against that someone like a Rory or a McIlroy or a Bubba Watson who just whips the club like as far back as they can and just explodes on the ball. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're all and they're all pros. Uh, so there's mm -hmm. not one there's not one way to do a golf swing. There is one way for every person to do a golf swing for them. And so if you focus on mindset as opposed to technical skill and ability, A, I think it's gonna make you a better golfer. You will perform better, but most importantly, you will enjoy yourself. Yeah. The meaning yeah. of golf becomes so much better because you're not focused on the technical aspects or necessarily upon shaving off yards or, or, or getting strokes down. And, you know, we all want to shoot better, but, sure. but by obsessively focusing on the technical elements, you, you, you lose, you lose the forest for the trees. And, uh, uh, honestly, I think you, you score worse when those are the things that you're focusing on. Yeah. That's At least true. That's, that's my personal experience of it. And I think mm -hmm. you see that contrast in golf instructors, right? Where you have, two vastly different schools of instruction. Uh, and I feel like players who get one school, maybe they do end up with able to hit the ball longer and they may be able to have more tricks in terms of the way that they can manipulate the ball. But are they mm -hmm. enjoying, are they enjoying the game as much? Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not so sure about that. Right. And I, I think often those people tend to break a little bit easier mentally too. Cause when something goes wrong, they, they, they just get so upset about it. Cause it's just, everything's not following the specific process that they've kind of dug themselves into and whereas yeah you could go out and if you're yeah just more and more of a purist of the sport just go out and play and have fun and and just don't don't worry about it you often end up just playing far better yeah. and, and than you would otherwise i mean it's a bit of a slow and steady versus kind of thing but it's yeah it's interesting to see how that works and i, I definitely learned that a lot when playing those hickory rounds i've really only played one full one before but mm -hmm. yeah i mean because you can't you can only hit it so far there's just not you know I, you really just it might take you six shots to get up to a green on a, on a regular course with hickory sticks but it's yeah but you know but it's but it's fun and actually I played pr pretty much better playing that way just because it was all right, just stick to stick to basics, have a good time, enjoy the company. And, you know, everything was smooth. I had less bad shots, at least. They might, yes. my score might not have been great, but for a lot of reasons, but I had way, way less bad shots than, than I normally would have. Cause I just, yeah, it was just, well, okay. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Just, just hit the ball, you know? And uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a, uh, it was a good time. So yeah, I, I encourage people to try that stuff out too. Although it definitely hitting the ball with the hickory club is, uh, can be very, can be frustrating on its own when it's, it's yeah. definitely very unforgiving uh, in a lot of ways. Yeah. <laughs> That's the one thing about the, that, that new technology is it's forgiving. You don't have to be perfect and it will give you a good outcome. Those old clubs, boy. Yeah. You really got, you really got to hit them true. Yeah. Uh, you got to hit, you ought to hit them cleanly if, if, if you're going to get the results you want. And that's, uh, I, again, it's that, that, uh, that relationship between expectation outcome and then, then meaning. And, you know, when it all lines up and you hit that great shot, yeah, there's no, there is no, there's no feeling like it. And I can only imagine what it would feel like to hit a, a hole in one. I've holed out from a long distance and it was during one of those rounds where you just hate yourself because you can't do anything right. And so uh, you yep. step up. I think I was like 75 yards away. I stepped up with a, with my 60 degree wedge and I just hit it and it just, it's one of those shots where you, you see it rolling in front of the green and on the green, you think, wait a second, this has a chance if it's yeah. hit right. And then it drops in the pin and you just think, wow, <laughs> That's how did that, e feeling. yeah, how did that even, how is that even possible? How did, how did that just happen? And why couldn't I have done that on the, you know, 70 previous strokes that I had taken? <laughs> sure. Yeah. It's an interesting game and in that it, it very, it varies so much and even even your own performance from day to day it's not like any other sport i've ever done where there's at least some level of consistency yeah i'd do jitsu and and you know soccer or whatever i'd go up and down a little bit for the day but it was within some kind of reasonable tolerance where golf i've had i've had you know the best day then gone out the next day and shot 20 you know 20 worse and i'm going what yep. the hell is going on and it could be something as simple as just a little thing bugging you in the back of your mind that had nothing to do with the game anyway and you never know it's uh it's 
that's a really it is very fascinating uh it's a yeah it's a fun one and even at the pro level that's what you see that same level of inconsistency right what do these guys do the second they get off the course well they go right to the range and they start tweaking their game they start working on their swing um and then the next day they come back and it's like they're a different player right um yeah so even for the people at the highest levels right the most proficient they they are a different player from day to day from hole to hole right yeah Yeah. um and there aren't many sports where you feel so on top of the world in one moment and then you just completely don't like you can't remember what it is you were doing and it and affects everybody from the you know the person who's just gone out for the first time to the to the professional yeah uh, yeah to the to the pro so it's it's that's again that that relational aspect of golf that even if you can't hit those shots, you can understand and you can see that frustration on on a professional golfer, or the adulation, or the 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 the, uh, the enjoyment or fulfillment they get when things are clicking. Uh, and mm-hmm. so that that again is something that speaks across across the skill level of the sport. Yeah, which is I think again something that um, it's something that the these golf course architects that I'm that I'm reading about who link all of this stuff together really focused on the importance of a golf course being able to be played by the best player and the worst player at the same time. And they both can find that excitement, challenge and enjoyment within the same hole. Um, Yeah. And that's, I think, again, part of the, part of the allure of golf is doesn't matter your skill. You can go out and, and somebody can shoot 70 strokes better than you, but you can play the same course relatively at the same pace uh, and have a great time doing it. Yeah, 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 it's really great like that. And I would, man, I was, we didn't even get to all the other fun topics we were going to jump into. I'm realizing we're, we're hitting, we're hitting some good time here. So seriously, I, 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 I yeah, I hope to, I hope to get you on again. Cause yeah, for everybody's knowledge, yeah, we were going to get into t- politics and all sorts of fun stuff, but it's almost nice that we didn't just for, uh, we'll, we'll keep this one a little more, uh, pure about sports and whatnot. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, ab- absolutely. I mean, that's, and that's what you want. You want to kind of have a conversation where you forget maybe what what were the aims that we wanted and we just sort of go to where the where where it seems natural to go yeah. and um much uh, like a good round of golf <laughs> abs- absolutely bring bring it for bring it full circle chris absolutely. there you go <laughs> awesome yeah, that was great awesome well hang out for a minute i'm gonna i'm gonna stop the recording and uh thank you everybody for listening oh and if people want to uh follow you or your work i mean other than uh, i you know where where should they go to have any interest in people checking out what you're doing or um they can find they can find my stuff on on twitter um my handle is at jb capital letters underscore goldstein um so you can you can find me there uh i'm publishing my first book uh, on hockey, the Stanley Cup, Canadian national identity. It's going through the review process oh. right now. It's an academic book. Um, but hopefully that should be out uh, relatively soon. Uh, and yeah, I'm not really sure what the future holds at this immediate moment, but um, but we'll see. Maybe there'll be more stuff in the future. Very cool. Well, that'll, that'll be nice. So hopefully people check out the book that have interest. And certainly uh, you're a good person to follow on Twitter too. You, you manage the fine art of of. I don't know. You you regulate your tweets and that you you say meaningful and important things and with a clear, uh, you know, you have an opinion, but you're never a jerk about how you put it. Or you, I know you're very very good with the diplomacy somehow on that. So I, I've never seen you get into nasty Twitter wars or anything like that, which just nice. I'm working on that skill myself. So it's tough. It's 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 tough. It's tough. It's basically try to try to interact on Twitter as you would if you were sitting across from that person. That's yes. A, that's a decent general general yeah. rule, and you, I mean, and no one can follow that really a hundred percent of the time. But Easy. I try to be the same person I am in real life uh, online, and I try and think, I try to think about who's reading it and what are the people I'm trying to influence, and how am I trying to influence them if that's my what I'm trying to do, and mm-hmm. that's that's the way I I I carry myself in real life. So yeah. I don't see why I should be any different uh, on online, and I wish. I wish there was more like that on on Twitter, but um, I agree. 
Yeah. But but it 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 does make for some interesting times, that's for sure. It, it does. Yeah. There there are times where I feed into some of that just being, you know, nose tweaking and stuff, but I try not to. I, that's my thing, especially on my Facebook, my big rule. It's it's on my profile. It says, you know, dinner, party, table rules, you know, don't if you can't behave as decently as more as civil as as civil as you would at a dinner party with someone, then for, you know, get the hell out. So but uh <laughs> but yes, I think uh, I think you're onto something good there and certainly I've I've appreciated it and it's nice to uh nice to have finally Finally, finally met you. You know, like you said today, it's some of the the good effects of uh, social media. Actually, yeah, uh, a- absolutely. Yeah. And I remember that first time when I think it was I, I I tweeted out something about people who have left the left wing and what were your experiences about how people taught you. And you you replied with these really heartfelt and genuine videos, which I thought was I thought that was incredible um, because oh, here here's this here's this person right who's, you know, thousands of kilometers, thousands of miles away from me, who's willing to, you know, tell their their intimate stories about these very difficult times. And uh, that's what really sort of uh, alerted me to, to maybe this is somebody that I want to be in more contact with. Um, somebody who's looking for the same things I'm looking for and experiencing some of the th- same things I've experienced, but is going about it in a genuine way. And we're likely to make mistakes and be clunky along the way. But um, sure. that's been one of the most rewarding things on Twitter is finding these other individuals who uh, who you can talk with uh, and who you can learn from as well. So uh, it's yeah. been a real pleasure uh, from my end from my end as well. So I just want to make sure that uh, that you knew that as well. Oh, likewise, it's it's been very much the same. I've I've enjoyed it every time I see a tweet coming out from me. I'm like, okay, this is one worth reading. So, so it's good stuff. And yeah, I hope to I hope to chat more. We'll get you if hopefully this podcast will will do well. The new one I haven't even gotten it fully set up yet, but it'll be nice to have this one to to show people. Uh, I think it'll everybody's gonna find it pretty interesting. And and I look forward to talking with you probably on the show in the future, but if not, off the show. So <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's kind of what I I when I reached out, I was like, hey, we should probably just like have a have a chat like maybe i'll crack a beer here you crack one there and we'll just we'll just we'll just we'll just, shoot, we'll just shoot the breeze so i mean yeah absolutely would love to keep it going awesome well thank you jordan and uh we will talk to you next time great thanks so much thanks. for the opportunity chris excellent thank you All right, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Radio Dell. If you want to find out more about the show or myself or our sponsoring company, you can head on over to chrisodell.com. That's C-H-R-I-S-O-D-E-L-L.com. And uh, just a little word about our sponsoring company since it uh, allows me the time and then the freedom uh, to be able to do this this podcast. Uh, that is a uh, company that I started back in 2007. It is a hemp gear company and what does that mean basically we have bags and clothing and all sorts of other uh, different accessories and fun things made with primarily uh, hemp textiles which are antimicrobial breathable of course very sustainable but we don't get too hippied out about it Uh, it's just good functional stuff good for you good for the planet whatnot and uh, and and we just try to make some really interesting and useful things so I hope you go check that out because that does help support the show that's at DS G-E-A-R.com, dsgear.com. And like I said, you can find a link to that over at chrisodell.com as well. Thanks again for joining us. Be seeing you.